Great. And um, in an effort to make up time, uh, we're going to be skipping the 3 o'clock break. But our next presenting company is Promethera Biosciences. Okay. So I think it's this way. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm going to present you in... In few minutes, the, the, the Prometera Biosciences, or technology activities and pipeline. Let's start by uh, the, the key and met needs, why the company has been founded in 2009, uh, which is the patients. Uh, you have here an illustration of the patient populations we are targeting currently in clinical trials. Uh, you see here premature newborns uh, that have uh, jaundice, uh, and this jaundice is uh, related to uh, the accumulation in the skin of a yellow pigment called bilirubin, which is highly toxic for the brain and provide this yellowish color, and is under UV to destroy through the skin the bilirubin and avoid the brain toxicity. And that is related to the immaturity of the liver that do not have the capacity to conjugate this pigment and to excrete it in the bile. In the bile. Um, Fortunately for the majority of these kids, after a few days or a few weeks, the liver become mature and you can relapse the treatment and the baby has a normal life. In some cases, the issue is not an immaturity of the liver, it's a genetic defect. The enzyme that conjugate the bilirubin in the hepatocyte, which is the main cells in the liver, it doesn't work, it doesn't function properly. And it's what you see here on the right. Uh, this disease is called krigler najar syndrome. And in these situations, the kids having this defect need to spend all her life, 10 to 12 hours per day under UV, to avoid brain toxicity. And she, if she forgets for one week or two weeks, she can die suddenly. Huh? So you imagine the quality of life you have in these situations. This krigler najar syndrome is an illustration of a disease in the family of inborn error of, of metabolism or genetic uh, that are all genetic based. There's more than 350 different genetic defects. Uh, the, the Fabry disease, the Dompe disease, etc., are related to uh, mutations of the hepatocyte. And uh, the only way to cure the patient here, as I said, is liver transplantation. What we want to do with Prometera is instead of changing the full piece, the full liver, is to infuse in, through the portal vein a stem cell coming from the liver of cadaveric donor to um, produce the missing enzyme in vivo, in the liver of, of the patients. So we do enzyme replacement, but here using the cells as the vector of the protein instead of infusing recombinant proteins in the blood. So the process, we are, the, the raw materials of our company is liver from cadaveric donor, the same liver than the one that could be transplanted because they fit the uh, liver transplantation criteria. And there is a tissue bank in Brussels. Uh, we are a Belgium-based company that can collect this liver and process it uh, through enzymatic digestions, uh, collagenase, and produce, after uh, centrifugation, human hepatocyte bag. And this, this human hepatocyte bag is the raw materials we are using in our GMP facility to purify and amplify in very large quantity the stem cell present in very small quantity in the human hepatocyte bag. Because this stem cell has the ability to proliferate, which is not the case for mature hepatocyte in vitro. At the end of the manufacturing campaign, we freeze the cells in liquid nitrogens, and when the patient is ready, we infuse the cell through a radio-guided catheter in the portal vein. And the cells, we cross the endothelium uh, of the vein and engraft in the liver and multiply, differentiate, and produce the missing enzyme. The key advantage of this process, which is a plate and weight process, is that it's simple. And with one liver, we can potentially today treat more than five, between four to 500 kids instead of one liver, one kids with liver transplantations. At the top of that, uh, one liver having from a healthy cadaveric donor without any genetic mutations have all the enzyme functioning in the hepatocyte. So with the same product, we call this product Epastem, we can treat potentially any of the 350 different genetic diseases. So we can consider the cells really as a platform, even if today we are focusing on two indications, krigler najar syndrome and uh, urea cycle disease, which is a disease related to mutations in the urea cycle in the hepatocyte with accumulation this time of ammonium in the blood and once again, big brain damages. So 
key figures and EPASTEM. So we are currently in phase one, two of clinical trial in Europe. We have enrolled 20 patients uh, in, uh, in Europe, Belgium, France, UK, Italy, and in Israel. We have GMP approved. Uh, we have uh, FDA uh, um, status from EMA and FDA. Uh, we have a team of 47 people. We have raised close to 50 million euros in two rounds of financing, including the grant and the loan from the, the Walloon region, the French-speaking French part of, of Belgium. And we get very interesting investors huh, because we have the Japanese Mitsui Global Investment, Vesalus Biocapital, Shire, a strategic investment boy, a vehicle, Boringer Engelheim Venture Fund, ATMI Pile, uh, which uh, we are using the, the bioreactor for the scale up of, of the product. So we have a nice uh, pool of investors uh, in the company. We have as well a patent that has been issued, granted in Europe, US, Japan, China, and we are waiting for, for the other countries. The key competitive advantage, uh, we, are, we have developed, identified, characterized, and patented an adult human mesenchymal progenitor cells. What it means is the cells come from the liver, and we are going to reinfuse to the liver. It's a progenitor of hepatocyte because it just do hepatocyte. When we try, you force to differentiate them in something else, fat, bone, whatever. It doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work properly. So it's really a cell that is already engaged in the hepatic lineage, and uh, it is a stem cell from mesenchymal origin, and we have the same property that over mesenchymal stem cell, meaning the low immunogenicity. So that has been demonstrated in vitro, uh, the low immunogenicity. It's an allogenic medicinal product. We have demonstrated and even um, published recently the effective engraftment and differentiations in the liver microenvironment of the stem cell in human. Uh, the, uh, the cells are resistant to cryopreservation, so we can really store the cells and have, uh, in, uh, after the manufacturing campaign, enough cells for years. Uh, we have even developed a reconstitution process where we can ship frozen cells uh, to, the, to the hospitals and in half an hour with a pre-filed syringe we can reconstitute the product and so it's really easy to, to use and off the shelf. So we have seen in vitro and proliferation with safe and stable phenotype and we believe as well longer duration of efficacy due to proliferation of this stem, stem cell in the stem cell niche in the liver. The pipeline. So today we are in pediatric in, for two indications, kriglan ajar and urea cycle disease. The six months follow-up will be closed April. We should have the full result uh, in June uh, this year. We are thinking about over-indication. We're working on over-indication with a different indication that would be feasible um, from the inborn error of metabolism of different hemophilia because we have seen that our cells could produce some uh, coagulation factors in vitro. We have as well the liver fibrosis, uh, which is uh, the, the step before the liver cirrhosis. And here again, in vitro and in animal study, we have, we have generated a uh, very interesting result showing the inhibitions of the fibrosis mechanisms through these stem cells, opening the door to, a, of course, here, a bigger market. Um, and uh, we have uh, as well established since the beginning of the company a very robust and senior management team. Myself already founded two biotech companies. One of them I sold to, to John Zyme uh, in 2002. The scientific founder is a very known and key opinion leader. He's a pediatric hepatolo uh, hepatologist and uh, very known in this area. Um, uh, and the, the big part of the organization spent between 15 and 20 years with GSK vaccine, the vaccine headquarter of GSK, which is based in Belgium, very close to our facility. Here it's the cluster effect, I would say, but they provide good expertise knowing biologics and how to develop biologics, which is extremely important for us. The business model. So we are definitely in the business model of the ultra orphan disease, the Johnsheim, the Shire, the Biomarine. So we are in the same model. So the, the incidence of urea cycle disease, you see it's 3,000 in Europe, 3,000 in US, maybe 15,000 in the world. So we are definitely in the same range that the enzyme replacement therapy that are currently on the market. kriglan ajar it's even more rare, but we selected this disease because we believe the clinical endpoint is a lot easier to address. It's level of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. But we have as well over range, over indication that could be uh, addressable by extension of indication later, uh, like PK, phenylketonuria, glycogenosis, and over. So I'm not going to, to cite all, uh, all the other disease. Of course, on this ultra-orphan disease, you have, and here you have a benchmark of the 
uh, price, a yearly average price in US of enzyme replacement therapy. For the majority of them, they are biologic, and you see we're in the range of 250K dollars, which is a good benchmark for us. Some of them get, you know, the so, so there is up to 410. The cost of the unique way to cure this patient, liver transplantations in US is close to half a million dollars. So we are really in a context where it's the, the, the treatment is costly, it's life-threatening disease, and uh, unfortunately, these kids spend their time, their time in hospitals due to decompensation. So the cost of the healthcare, for the healthcare system in US and Europe of this disease is just huge. Clinical development plan. So we are currently doing two clinical trials in parallel. An investigational clinical study uh, where we treat the patients with free uh, dose range uh, low, mid, and high dose, and we are doing, conducting in parallel an observational study where we are following with the current st standard of care, the, the disease, to see the natural history and the disease progressions. The idea is to, do, to have match control and to see between responders and match control what is the, uh, the, the, the difference and the, the impact of, of the cells. So we are following the pediatric EMEA guidelines, so we have segmented in three cohorts of, of weight of, and age, so above 20 kilos, between 10 and 20 kilos, and below 10 kilos, with three dose, low, mid, and high dose, uh, so it's dose range study on both indications. Uh, we, are con we could pull the both indications because the primary endpoint is still the safety, but the second endpoint is primary efficacy. And for the primary efficacy, we have been working a lot on the readout. You know, one of the key issues for cell therapy is to have a clear readout of the functionality of the cells in vivo. And, in, and for urea cycle disease, there is a, a test using a tracer, a stable isotope called C13, where that can be followed through mass spect in the blood of the patient that take peros uh, sodium acetate, which is the substrate of the, of the urea cycles. You see here an illustration of uh, these urea cycles. This is the mitochondria and this is the, uh, the, the hepatocyte. Uh, so the sodium acetate, which is uh, taken peros, entering the livers through the portal vein, is metabolized through the urea cycles and produce urea C13. So the C13 from the acetate is, uh, can be measured through urea C13 if the cycle functions properly. Huh? And when it functions properly, you have this kind of curve, so called ureogenesis, where the C13, the, the accumulations of urea C13 reach up to one hour, a bit more, a plateau, then you have a slightly decrease related to the consumption of the sodium acetate with time. For the disease patients, you have a f almost flat uh, a curve, uh, and sometimes some very s small uh, area under the curve, because you can measure area under the curve of, of the, or the plateau. And here we have a really clear functional test, to, because we are using this test in our current clinical trials, prior the infusion of the cells, three months, six months, and 12 months post-infusion of the cells. And we are generating the data that are, uh, from what we have, quite interesting and, and encouraging. So, we try and we have as well a functional um, uh, potency test of the cells as we can measure the, the activity of the cells in vitro by measuring the rea producing by cells by hours, so which is extremely specific. So we have a clear potency test, a clear functional test, and uh, we hope the right clinical trials to go further. In terms of clinical development plan, what you see here is definitely a synthesis. Huh? We expect for this range of disease to get approval or conditional approval with two clinical trials. It's definitely feasible uh, with good, of course, good clinical data uh, to get this conditional approval, meaning you carry on some study uh, later on, but you get the, the, the permissions to market the product. And that we expect to launch a new clinical trial this year in Europe and uh, another one uh, in, in US and in Europe in 2000, beginning of 2015, and to be able to get uh, conditional approval in the course of the year of 2017. I would like to thank you for, for your attention, and I just see the seconds, I'm three seconds over <laughs> the time, so thank you for, very much for your time.